with us. Uh, Alex, uh, special thanks to you for finding some time uh, and preparing this webinar for our teachers from four institutions, in fact, today. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be kind of moderating this meeting. So if you have any questions, any doubts, uh, just type them in in the chat box. Uh, if uh, those questions would be addressed to me, please type them in in Polish, uh, if to Alex, in English, obviously. Okay, so um, I'm not going to be boring you to death. Uh, so, Alex, uh, the floor is yours, sort of. Okay, thank you so much. That's <laughs> a later than never. Um, <laughs> okay. So, hello, and now, now we can see Adrian. There he is. <laughs> How are you that? Better late than ever. Okay, so thank you again for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alex Warren, and I work as the teacher trainer for National Geographic Learning. Um, and I know many of you are, in fact, most of you are using one or some of our courses, hence why we're doing this wonderful webinar. Um, of course, I would much rather be with you, um, as I was meant to be this week. But of course, the world has changed tremendously in the last six weeks or so. And so I've been living in my house permanently, no travel, no airports, no airplanes, doing webinars all around the world. So hopefully by now I've become an expert in delivering webinars, right? Um, so there we go. So listen, before we start, just a, a couple of housekeeping rules, okay? Um, First of all, if you do have any internet connection, so for example, if the, the sound is a bit funny, if the video is a bit funny, anything going wrong, we'd always recommend signing out and then signing back in again with the link that you got from your registration. Um, I've noticed that a couple of you are logged in two times. Um, so if you logged in twice, you might be hearing an echo. So I would suggest logging off on one of them okay um and we will be providing certificates at the end of the session as well so don't worry about that i will upload those and share them with you okay and the final thing to say is that even though i'm not with you in person this is still going to be a, a highly interactive webinar um, so we'll be doing that using the chat box and some polls as well. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> also, you should see above the PowerPoint a little man holding his hand up, who I like to call Bob. And every now and again, I will ask you to either agree or disagree with a statement or to hold your hand up. So just very quickly, um, can you just... Put your hand up to let me know that you are ready to start. There we go. All the bobs are putting their hands up. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So listen, listen. Uh, today's session then is all about the importance of word partnerships. The uh, no word is an island. And I want to start with a very quick warmer. I'm going to show you a picture or four pictures of famous people. And I want you to tell me what connects these four people, apart from the fact that they are famous. So using the chat box, what links, what connections do these four people have? What do they have in common? Very good, boy, check, they are people. Or <laughs> well, you could argue that maybe Wallace is not so much of a person. Success, yeah. Something more than that, though. Iconic. Yes, they are iconic. Entertainment. Good. Hi, Thomas. Any other suggestions? They had to deal with problems of some sort? Yeah, potentially. Try to think outside the box, maybe. Um, you know, when you think about John Lennon, who who do you think of? Who else do you think of? Who comes to mind? Okay, Yoko. 
<laughs> that's not the right answer, Wojtek. But it's a good answer. Um, okay, what about Batman? We think of Batman, we think of... Who might we think of with Batman? Gotham City. There's a place. But think of a who. Batman and... Robin, there we go. We think of Wallace. We think about... Handsome. <laughs> okay, Gromit. We think, yeah, Gromit. Thank you, Anna. And we think about Laurel. And we think about finally Hardy. Exactly. So these guys are all partnerships. They have a sidekick of some sort. And we might argue that they are better with a sidekick. So Lennon and McCartney, Batman and Robin, Wallace and Gromit. Laurel and Hardy, on their own, they're great. But when they're together, they create magic. And that, for me, is exactly the same with words. On their own, words are good, they're useful, they're helpful. But they're so much better when they are working in partnerships, when we learn them in partnerships. And you only really know a word, just like you might know Batman, Lennon, when they're with the others. You only know a word when you know who they work with. So as J.R. Firth, the father of collocation, once said, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. You might know the pronunciation. You might know the spelling. You might know the meaning. That pales into insignificance without knowing who those words like to hang out with, who are their partners. So during this session, we're going to look at what exactly we mean by word partnerships, so defining it, and then we're going to look at lots of different activities connected to how we can exploit them, how we can teach them, and, and why they're important to teach as well. So what exactly do we mean by word partnerships? Because it's quite a broad term, and I, I, ch I chose a broad term on purpose, because it does encompass different types of word partnerships. So I'm going to show you some different sentences and I want you to identify the word partnership within that sentence. Now, just for clarification, a word partnership doesn't mean just two words. It could be longer as well, okay? But essentially words which are commonly found together. So we're, we're, let's, let's look at the first one together. So the first one's here. When I was younger, I was always told that the early bird catches the worm, but I'm not sure I agree. So in the chat box, what is the word partnership in that sentence, do you think? It's an easy one to start with, right? Perfect. Yeah, early bird catches the worm. Thank you, Helena. But how would we define that as a word partnership? What subheading might we give it? Perfect. Thank you, Anna. It is an idiom or a fixed expression, we cannot change it. Easy, let's look at number two, a bit harder. The nearest news agent is just in front of the cinema. What's the word partnership? And how might we define it? What heading could we give it? Lots of you writing, which is good to see. Oh, Helena is on fire today. Just in front of. Perfect. So that's the word partnership. How might we define it? What kind of, you know, the first one is an idiom or a fixed expression. Just in front of is a... Testing your, your meta-language knowledge here. A couple of answers coming in, maybe. Yeah, I'll take that answer. I, I, I can't pronounce the name. Mad, mad, good. I'm not even going to try. Um, it is a prepositional phrase. Okay, number three. I'll have a pint of Guinness, please. Or a pint of <laughs> whatever you fancy. Adrian's enjoying that one. Yeah, a pint of... Anything, any other suggestions? A pint of... Okay, I do agree a pint of is fine. But actually, for me, it's more than that. I think actually the whole phrase, I'll have a pint of Guinness, please, 
could be referred to as a word partnership because it's a, a familiar structure that words are going to follow it. I'll have a pint of water. I'll have a pint of beer. I'll have a pint of vodka Red Bull. I'll have a pint of whatever, please. So it's a chunk and it's sort of an extended piece of text which is changeable. And that's the kind of the key thing. Whereas the idiom is a fixed expression, this is unfixed. We can change it, we can manipulate it. But it's a set of text that you would use in multiple situations. Okay, number four. The wind was bitterly cold as it blew across the open fields. Agnieszka, don't worry about being late. You're here now. So what is the word partnership there? There is metaphor there, good, but it's something more specific. And there are two examples, I should say. Good, Irina's uh, bitterly cold. And what's the second one? There's another one as well. Good, again, open fields. And these are, what are these? They are examples of waiting for an answer. Collocations, yeah, easy, Anna, perfect. They are collocations. Um, these, in this case, are either adjective noun or adverb adjective collocations. Um, but of course, collocations come in all different shapes and sizes in terms of the strength. So you get lots of what we call a unique collocation, like pitch black, for example. But you also get collocations which are very weak, like white shirt. Now, white could go with anything. It could be a white shirt, white trousers, white uh, tablecloth, white handkerchief, white anything. But these are weak collocations. Okay, uh, next one. Number five, okay, okay, I hear you loud and clear. I need to be cool, calm, and collected. What is the word partnership? Good, void check, loud and clear, anything else? Yeah, loud and clear, cool, calm, and collected, great. What do we call these? They have a very special name. They're not just a, an idiom or a fixed expression. They have a specific term. Do you know what they're called? Emphasis? They do add emphasis, you're right. They are illiterate to an extent. Thank you, Anna. They are binomials. Camilla, a simile is as big as a horse, or as big as or as small as a whatever. So, binomials, trinomials. That's really, really common. Um, you know, with, with binomials, we might think loud and clear, uh, neat and tidy, bits and pieces, salt and pepper, uh, fish and chips, etc. Okay, number six. Bit of a tricky one. I've never really been interested in the cult of celebrity. What is the partnership? And how might we define it? Yeah, great, Vote. Interested in. Okay, your different names for them, can phrase, fixed phrase. For me, they are dependent prepositions, interested in, cult of. You don't teach the word jealous without teaching jealous of. They go together. You don't teach interested without in. And, you know, there's so many examples of dependent prepositions, whether it's with, with a verb, whether it's with, with a noun or, or an adjective. No, just another form of a word partnership. And the last one, last one, everyone's favorite. I've always looked up to my older brother. Easy one to finish. There we go. Looked up to, phrasal verb. Absolutely right. So here we've got seven different categories of word partnership. And, and this is purely for your benefit as teachers. I would certainly not go into this in detail with my students. I would just use a term that covers all of them, word partnerships, multi-word phrases, whatever it might be. We don't want to confuse our learners. This is just more for your professional development, your knowledge. But what I would say, um, there's a really nice quote from a guy called Morgan Lewis. It would not be wrong if we claim that all collocations are idiomatic, and all phrasal verbs and idioms are collocations, 
or contain collocations, as all are predictable combinations of different kinds. So as, as Juliet once said, what's in a name? It doesn't matter what we call them. The point is that they are all predictable combinations. We know as learners what should come next because we're learning it as a partnership, as a combination that we know is very common. Therefore, it goes, they, they go together. So why are they so important? Well, we, we kind of touched on this already, but I want to go into it in a little bit more detail and how they can help our learners become better learners of English. Because that's the absolute crux. Learning word partnerships, collocations, etc., makes our learners better. Because as Morgan Lewis again points out, collocations allow learners to process and produce language at a much faster rate. Put your hands up if you want your students to process and produce language at a faster rate. Everybody, of course we do. That is the dream. We get frustrated when our students aren't progressing at, a, at, at the speed that we want them to. But maybe that's because we as teachers are focusing too much on things which are not so important. Well, not, not important, but maybe are deemed to be more important. And by that, I mean grammar. Because a lot of teachers, a lot of students think grammar is the key to moving up to the next level to improving. But actually, research suggests that it is, in fact, vocabulary and specifically the, the knowledge of collocations word partnerships. Because, as Morgan Lewis goes on to say, they are assumed to make up beep percentage of everything we say here, read or write in real life. My question to you, though, is what is the missing percentage? So we've got a poll here. Have a look and choose which one you think is correct. So we've got 40%, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90%. Okay, voting's coming in. Keep on voting. I'll give you another five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Broadcast the results. So we can see there, it's a good mix of answers, really. 60% um, say, sorry, five of you say 60%, four of you say 70%, seven say 18, eight say 90. Interesting. So, so what's good here is we, we've gone high. The majority of us have gone high. Um, what is the answer? This is the answer. 70%, which is, like I say, it, it is tremendously high. Um, but actually, maybe you're not altogether surprised because you went, you went high anyway. So clearly then, if they are so prevalent in everyday life, then surely we should be teaching them more, focusing on them more in our classes. But I just want to prove this point, okay, that there is up to 70% or, or even more, because every text will be different, right? It's not always 70%. So I've taken this text from Outcomes Intermediate. And I should say I could have chosen any text. And I want you to very quickly just read through it. And in the chat box, type in any word partnerships that you find. Okay. Have a quick read. Once you finish reading, then send like a list of them rather than sort of doing them in individually. Like a good way to take Friday night. I'd go so far as to say Friday night out. Yeah, quite special. Light meal, start with good Helena, good Wojtek again. A little sushi, yeah, we often say a little something, a little sushi, a little this, a little that. Sunset, well, I didn't say the sun never sets. Friday night, quite special, go and play. Ten to go and play, yep. An early dinner, around midnight, good, Wojtek. Amazing landscape, Anna can't see any text, that's in, I'm not sure why, Anna. Go for a swim, depend on, yep around four, 
yeah, meet me around three o'clock, four o'clock, four thirty. The point is, they're everywhere, right? This is what I came up with. Most of them you've said already. A light meal around midnight, something like that. You know, students say that a lot, you know, or, or something like that. Natural hot springs, go for a swim, depend on, I'm a bit past clubbing or I'm a bit past doing something, right? So they're everywhere. And this is a really simple activity that you can do at the end of any reading lesson or any listening lesson using the audio script. You need to get a student to look back at the text and say to them, okay, you have five minutes, just go through the text again, underline, highlight any word partnership that you can find. Now, of course, the first time that you do this, they may not be great, okay? It takes training. But if you do it every single lesson, that you, every single reading lesson or, or speaking uh, or listening lesson, they're going to get better and better and better at, at it. And the more their awareness is raised, the better they are at going to be to process it or to, pro to produce it in their own writing and in their own speaking. And actually, this is an activity that can be easily done in the online environment. So I do want to try to link things to the online teaching environment that we find ourselves in nowadays as well. So using a program like Zoom, Zoom's great because you have all of these annotation tools which students have access to as well. So you could get the text on the screen and ask students to work collaboratively to underline the or to highlight the different word partnerships together. It might be that you assign different paragraphs to different students. And you know you might get something like this. I did the first paragraph, um, but it's involving the learners in the online learning world, the virtual classroom. I think that's really important. So, like I say, many of these activities can work in the virtual classroom. Okay. So, what other benefits are there of learning lexical chunks, word partnerships? Call them what you like. Um, First of all, they, they help enrich and revitalize existing vocabulary. You know, I'm sure we all have students who are obsessed with just learning new words. I, I remember a Japanese student I had, and every day he'd come in with a list of words he'd found in a dictionary and thought were brilliant. And I'm like, it's nice, but you don't know how to use them. What you need to focus on is, <laughs> I wish it was either. What you need to focus on is getting the students to think about what they already know and seeing how they can use those words together. So, for example, the word business is a word that we would teach at a low level, maybe elementary, pre-intermediate for sure, right? But we can use business in so many different ways with words which students already know as well. So this is an activity I called Word Volcano. Because I give them one word and they brainstorm lots and lots of words that connect with it. For example, business trip or business man or business meeting, for example. So what I would like you to do in the chat box, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think of as many collocations with business as you can. Think of words that come before the word, as well as words that come afterwards, okay? But don't just do it individually. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds, and then at the end of the 30 seconds, press enter so that all of the words are in one big list, okay? So I don't want just individual words, I want words that are together in a big list, okay? So your 30 seconds start now. Publications with business. Seconds. Okay, ten seconds. Oh, I see no tech. Five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Okay, press enter. Let's see your lists. 
Wow, look at Agnes, got loads there. Out on business, line of business, do business, a tough business, business sector. Wow, you guys are good. Business contact, do business, business partner, business model. Amazing. Now, what you can then do, of course, is put this all into a big table for your learners, um, or you get it all on the board. Um, I was going to share some other ones with you. And some more. And some more. And some more. Um, now, that's a huge amount of collocations that students could come up with, or at least you could give to students. But the point is, it's just one word that they know, business, and it's just expanding it tremendously. And like I said, you know, in a normal class, when you do this as a big brainstorm onto the board, but it's equally possible to do it within the online classroom using collaborative whiteboards. So again, I, I did this screenshot using Zoom. So as a teacher, you could open an interactive collaborative whiteboard, put your keyword at the center, and then get students to, to annotate, to brainstorm together. So it's a really simple activity to do. And of course, as a follow-up, you can then get students to do different activities. Choose your five favorite collocations with business and write five sentences about your life or people you know or things that you are connected to, so making it meaningful. Maybe you ask them to write a story using those collocations, um, whatever it might be, but there needs to be some active production as well. But what it does, it just shows them that using words they already know and putting them together creates something more, something greater than the individual part. A similar game to that is something called the, the collocation iceberg game. Now this, it doesn't really work in the online classroom, I have to say, um, but it works really, really well in the, in the real world classroom. And, and the first section is the same as what we just did. You give the students a word and they brainstorm collocations. And they put these above the waterline. So up here, for example, because an iceberg is, just from my own observation, similar to a student's knowledge of a word and its collocations. Because there's always more under the water. A lot more under the water, right? I think something like 80% of an iceberg is underwater. I, it is unknown. So with this activity, in pairs, in groups, students brainstorm and they put the words above the waterline. Then they change paper with the group next to them. And you read the new piece of paper and are the students going to have the same words or different words, do you think? In the, in the chat box, say, write same or different. Are students going to have the same words or different words, do you think, generally speaking? Lots of people typing. Yeah, exactly, Ava, different. Because every student has had different learning experiences. They have different knowledge. Exactly. It depends on their learning experiences. So therefore, there will be different words. So they're learning. Or maybe they've just forgotten about a word that maybe collocate, in this case, with family. So what you then do, you ask students to write on the new piece of paper any other words underneath the waterline because it was unknown or had been forgotten by the first group. You then repeat the process. So the paper then goes to another group. Repeat the process. The paper goes to the next group until the paper's moved all the way around the whole class and has come back to the original group. At which time, if the activity has worked as it should, there should be more words underneath the iceberg than on top of the iceberg. Now, the beauty of this activity is that all of the input has come from the students. It is entirely student focused, student generated. As a teacher, all you've had to do is set up the activity. And yeah, you might feed in a few words here and there just to help them, 
So essentially, it is students producing it all. They are essentially peer teaching each other. And again, there are various follow-up activities you could do. But the point is, it's taking words which they know and putting them together with other words that they know. Therefore, hopefully making them more, well, fluent and being able to process and produce language at a faster rate. So just a couple of quick activities there. Uh, let's move on. Uh, what I should say actually then is that, of course, we need a course book to support this as well, right? So any of you who have been using or have used something like Outcomes knows that there is a huge focus on collocations and word partnerships. So with this activity here, it's not just matching one word to another, it's matching three words to words. So we've got three collocations with one word. For example, make your own, wear a, hide behind a mask. Builder, ride on a, a mm, in the shape of a fish, a float, and so on. And what you could then do is get students to add in extra words as well, come up with their own ideas. Similarly, in, in uh, life, this is an example from, from the Upper Intermediate, we've got a keyword uh, as keep, and again, different expressions of keep, but again, I'll get students to brainstorm other words that they know with keep. Um, like, I, I don't know, I, don't want to, I can't think of any others. Now I can't think of it, but yeah, keep a secret, keep track of. I don't want to keep you, keep a diary, whatever it might be. Um, keep a, a dark secret, maybe. So I think within a course, we, we might have these like little sections on, on collocations, but we can expand them. We can focus more on them for sure. They can be exploited for more than what they are in the course book. Okay. Um, and it also comes down to how we get students to record vocabulary, right? So. I want you to imagine that you taught the word coffee to your elementary or beginner level class. And what verb normally gets taught with coffee at a low level? What is the most common verb collocation? Drink. Exactly. But here's a question for you. How often do you say, I drink coffee? My guessing is not often. You don't say, I drink coffee, I drink. You don't, you don't say it. You, what you say more often is, I'll have a coffee, or let's go for a coffee, or I'm going to make a coffee, right? So when a course book only gives you one collocation for a word, I think it's always beneficial to add more in for the learners. That's going to be more helpful for the students. Now, generally, you might just add two or three, depending on the level. You know, I've given you a choice here, but there are lots of different collocations or verb collocations with coffee. So you've got to think, what is the most useful for your learners? And similarly, we can add in an adjective as well, because there's no point in just teaching drink coffee or go for a coffee. What kind of coffee do you want? Black coffee, a white coffee, a hot coffee. Colombian coffee, a Brazilian coffee, an Italian coffee, whatever it might be, right? And um, whatever your preference is, a milky coffee, um, maybe. Um, but the point is, when you get students to record vocabulary in this way, it's far more likely to stick in their mind because essentially we're giving them a ready made piece of text. Have a, a hot coffee, have a, I need my morning coffee, I have to have my morning coffee, whatever it might be. Um, I just want to draw your attention to this website as well, actually. This is called justtheword.com. So for all of the activities so far, don't think that I spent hours trying to find or think of collocations. I didn't. I just went to this website and typed in my keyword, and it comes up with all of the collocations, expressions, idioms that use that word. So it's a really, really great website to have on hand when you're thinking about doing work with keywords, okay? So just the word.com, I highly recommend it. Okay, let's move on. 
Okay, so AWL. Now I'm sure all of you know what the AWL is, right? Working in universities, I would hope that you would do. Um, but just to check, can you write down what AWL stands for? Just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Very good, lots of you typing. <laughs> okay, Anna, that's good. Yes, it is absolutely without leave. But thinking about English language teaching, what does it mean? I love that, Anna. You've caught me out there completely. Yeah. Wojtek's got it there in, in Polish. It is the academic word list, um, which maybe you're not familiar with. Um, so the academic word list is a list of the top 570 academic words in English that has been put together by a lady called Avril Coxall. Um, and you can search for that online. So it's the academic, I'm going to type in the chat box for you. But that's not what I'm interested in, because there's also something called the ACL, which, given the title of today's talk, you can probably guess what it is, right? It's the Academic Collocation List, um, which is a list of nearly 2,500 academic collocations, which comprises the most frequent most pedagogically relevant lexical collocations in written academic English. And it was compiled from the Pearson International Corpus of Academic English, which has over 25 million words in it. So it's, it's well researched, it's thoroughly well put together. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's not the most exciting document, of course it isn't. But it takes the key academic words and puts them with their most frequent academic collocations. This is the website down here, so if you want to take a quick screenshot, please do. If we look in a little bit more detail, I chose the word academic just because. Um, you can see there that I think it's like the top 17 words. Um, as well, so it's yeah, it, it's I think from from a, from a learning academic point of view, it's really really helpful. But I thought it'd be interesting to test you guys on this a little bit. So I chose the word crucial. So what I would like you to think of is the top one, two, three, four, five, yeah, seven academic collocations that go with crucial. So type any ideas that you have in the chat box. So Wojciech says, concept. Okay, concept, solution, problem, good ideas, method, area. Good, Helena. Agnieszka says, information, idea, point, good, Anna. Ava says, understanding. I, I do like that. It's a crucial understanding, crucial issue. Good for Marta. Role research problem. Moment says Dorita. Case study. That's a good one. Crucial timing. I think Ava, that crucial timing is a really good one. But I'm not sure it's academic. It's more of a general English one. Let's let's see how many we got. These were the top seven. So we had definitely had role. I'm not sure we had question. Point we definitely had, part, important thing we had, factor, I think we had difference, maybe not. Um, but it's just quite interesting. But remember, it is written academic English rather than more general English. And, and what I should say as well, um, just talking about these sort of academic word lists, of course, these are sort of crucial for any English for academic purpose program. Um, and just to plug one of our titles very quickly, we have a course called Pathways, which is an academic English course for reading and writing and listening and speaking and critical thinking skills. But it, it, it has a very strong focus on the academic word list as well. 
Um, but that's something you can ask Adrian more about later on. But it's, it's a really great series called Pathways. Okay, let's on. So the point here, really, as Scott Thornberry points out, is that the mental lexicon is not so much a dictionary, but a phrase book. Therefore, we should be teaching in phrases and collocations, not in dictionary format. It is more useful. Okay, so what else are the benefits of lexical chunks? We said about earlier about the processing of language. It actually, research suggests, helps improve natural speech and fluency. Two things which we want our students to achieve as much as possible. Now, I, I've kind of seen this firsthand. You get, I saw a lot of Japanese, Chinese students, and they, they talk very staccato because they have to think about words individually rather than thinking of words as parts so they think about they need to think about it as chunks of text rather than individual words so it can it can impact really negatively learning words individually on fluency and uh, native like speech and some interesting research quite old research admittedly by paul insider suggests that memorized sentences and phrases are the normal building blocks of fluent spoken discourse. And they go on to say that in particular, we find that multi-clause fluent units generally consist partly or wholly of a familiar collocation. Which for me is, it's just really strong evidence that if we want our students to be more fluent, this is the way forward for our learners. No question. Because it's giving them, it's essentially what it is, is grammaticalized lexis. So they don't have to think about the grammar, it's kind of within the phrases already. And I think that can be the main stumbling block for many students. They're thinking about the grammar and trying to put together a sentence by themselves. When most of the time, they don't need to because it exists as an existing chunk of text somewhere. So again, this should reflect in how we actually teach our learners vocabulary. So this is another example from Outcomes. And within Outcomes, all of the vocabulary is always done in context. There's no point in teaching lists of words. because It doesn't show students how to use them. And that is the absolute crux of the matter. They don't know how to use a word because they've seen learned it individually. What's the point of teaching it that way? So instead of teaching the word weird, we teach it as a phrase. Something was quite weird or is quite weird. It's not just overrated. It was or it is a bit overrated. It's not just moving. It's really moving. It's not just sold out. It was completely sold out. And so on and so forth. Um, and that is far more memorable for learners than just learning them as individual words. It's not hot, it's boiling hot. Or well, not just boiling, not just hot, boiling hot together. Not just absolutely, not just packed, it was absolutely packed. Not just tears, but in tears. You get the idea. So just to kind of test that kind of point, um, I would normally do this as a live audience, right? But because we're not live, it, it's a bit tricky to do. Um, but just to yourself, I should you really shout to yourself what the answers to these sentences are. Because these are all expressions, idioms that you should know as near native C2 level speakers of English. So when the tough gets sorry, when the go when the going gets tough, the tough get going, I hope you all shouted. People in glass houses. Shouldn't throw stones. When in Rome, do as the Romans. If you can't beat them, join them. I can, I can hear you shouting all the way from Poland. It takes all sorts to make a world. 
This one we had earlier, the early bird. I can hear you, catches a worm. Never look a gift horse in the mouth. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Too many cooks, spoil the broth. Every cloud has a silver lining. The grass is always greener on the other side. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. But the point is, okay, yes, these are all fixed expressions, but just by reading them out, you should know already what comes next. And that's the key thing. It's knowing in advance what comes next. It's learning it as a single item of text. So we do that with idioms. So why don't we do that with individual words and their collocations? So here, really nice activity. They're all possible collocations, mind-numbingly, largely, pretty boring, but you choose one which is appropriate for you. Gardening is technically, physically, not terribly demanding. Well, it's all your opinion, but it's giving you choice. It's not just one collocation, it's three collocations each time. Far more beneficial for language learning. And this example from, is from, from life. And again, you know, this is within the real world or the real life lessons. Set phrases, set expressions that we use all the time in spoken language. Are you serious? Are you sure? Come off it. That can't be right. You must be joking. You're having me on. Fixed expressions or set expressions are essentially word partnerships. It makes us sound more natural. That holy grail of language learning. And I came across this idea recently of, of pronunciation thought groups, which can help with this idea of fluency. And the idea was that when students are reading out answers to questions, it's trying to get them to focus on the correct kind of sentence stress and how words are grouped together within a sentence um, to help improve the fluency. Because you know, if I ask one of my students to read this sentence, they might they might say this: My best friend started her own company about five years ago, right after college. And while the pronunciation might be great and the words all individually pronounced fine, you lose track of it because they're not reading it in a fluent way. So we need to chunk them in groups. So it might be something like, my best friend started her own company about five years ago, right after college. It just breaks it down. The second one, her son wants to study business and then work at a bank. Running a successful business is not easy because you work a lot and have to take risks. <clears throat> so it's a really nice activity to do while students are, maybe they finished their gap fill activity already, maybe they've done the reading questions already. Just to go back and look at the text and think, okay, if I was gonna read this out loud, how am I going to chunk the text together to make it sound more fluent? Pronunciation thought groups. So it's, it's an interesting technique. Um, and I tried it with my students, and, and actually, they found it really useful. And despite my kind of initial reservations, they found it a really beneficial way to help them to become more fluent. Think of words in chunks. Okay. Um, and again, this is something that can be done in the online classroom using a, a collaborative interactive whiteboard with your, with your learners. So you take your sentence and you get them to annotate it for you. It might just be simple of putting in the pronunciation thought groups. But if you want to take it further, um, this is using Zoom, you could get them to think about linking sounds. You could get them to think about word stress, sentence stress. If you work hard, stress on hard, and treat people well, you'll be successful. So you can do various things using the tools available in the online classroom. Now, one of my favorite activities to do in the real world classroom that kind of really helps with this idea is something called Race the Teacher, which is an idea I got from 
a lady called Sandy Millen, and this is her blog down here. And this is how it works. So I take some key phrases, key qualifications that I've been teaching in my class, and I put them into sentences. And then I drill them. So the first step is you just drill the students as you would normally drill anything, right? At the end of the day, we just don't know. Tell the truth, I've not seen it. You might do that a couple of times to get them really familiar with it. Stage two, they reread it by themselves. In their heads, all sort of sub vocalizing. So they're getting more and more familiar with it, i.e. repetition. Stage three, you put them into pairs and they race each other. They have to say the six sentences as quickly as they can. So developing that fluency, developing that automaticity. Now you might do that a couple of times, maybe three times. Then you do it a final time with the teacher. So stage four is racing the teacher and of course students love to race the teacher they like to try and beat the teacher now yes the activity is noisy it's riotous it's a little bit mad but i guarantee there'll be lots and lots of laughter at the end of it because students enjoy it and it gives giving them repetition of key phrases to help build that automaticity and that fluency that native speaker like thing that we're trying to achieve for our learners like I say, you can find out more at the blog there from Sandy Millen. Okay, why else are they good? They awaken students' awareness of how of patterns and how words work together. So by this, we're talking about a little bit of the colligation of words, how they grammar. So for example, this is actually from Outcomes Intermediate. We've got an activity using collocations. But then the follow-up question is this. Where possible, notice the grammar they are used with. Because words follow familiar patterns. We know a lot about gerunds and infinitives, right? I prefer verb plus ing, for example. I'm interested in verb plus verb ing. It's a pattern, right? So I just want to do an experiment with you which I've done before, and sometimes it works, sometimes it fails. So let's, let's give it a go online. So I'm going to ask you to finish this sentence for me, OK? There's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. It's one of the mm, and then finish that sentence as naturally as you can. Okay, good, Agnes. One of the best things that has ever happened to me. Thank you. Barbara, can you finish that sentence? One of the best films I've ever seen, says Irina. One of the best moments in my life. It's one of the best, one of the busiest academic years ever. It's one of the best experiences I've ever had. Okay, so look, about 50% of you have done exactly what I expected you to do. Right? Which is one of the best I have ever because it's a very familiar pattern. Okay, not all of you done it, that's fine, but I think at least 50% of you have done one of the greatest things I've ever eaten, seen, I've ever done, I've ever been to, whatever it might be. It's one of the best plus present perfect. Let's do a second example, okay? Just because. Finish that sentence as naturally as possible. Okay, Eva, finish that sentence. Just because I love you, Okay, voice X says, you're, just because you're intelligent, that doesn't make you a better person. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean good, Anna. Just because you're my brother doesn't mean perfect. All of you are doing this because it is a pattern. We can call this a word partnership of sorts because it is a familiar 
combination of words. Um, interesting, right? Um, and thankfully, the experiment worked. So good job, you guys. Well done. I'm going to give you a little clap using my my uh, clapping pausing icon. Okay, good. Um, and, and those kind of patterns appear throughout language. It's just being able to identify them. Okay, what else? Um, it can aid reading fluency and listening ability because instead of listening or reading for individual words, you are reading in chunks or listening in chunks, which makes it easier to, to comprehend, i.e. to process the language. But like we saw at the start with a quote from Morgan Lewis, it allows you to process language at a faster rate. Now, a couple of activities you can do to practice this, which we cannot do online, it doesn't work is first of all a dicto gloss um, can you put your hand up very quickly if you've heard of a dicto gloss activity you might know it as a, a grammar dictation is the other name for it okay wow no one no hands up okay so very quickly a dicto gloss so the teacher would read a text in fact you know what no we can't, it won't work online so a teacher would read a text to the learners and they just listen to understand it. And then at the end of the reading, you say to the students, write down anything that you can remember. Now, normally what students do, would just write lists of individual words, which is okay. But when I do this activity with teachers, do you think they write down individual words? No, of course they don't. They write down chunks of text because they are advanced listeners of English. They know how to listen. They listen in chunks of language. So when you do this with students and they write down a list of individual words, you say, that's great. Okay, listen a second time. I'll reread it a second time. I want you to listen again and listen for what words those words match with. Okay? So you're encouraging them to listen for chunks of text instead. And then you reread it and hopefully they kind of build up what they have already. And then you read it a third time. This time you allow them to, to take notes as they go through. Listening, take, taking notes, but not as individual words, as chunks of text. And you repeat the process until they've all rebuilt the text. Um, hopefully that's been understood, but it's called a dicta gloss. Go online, have a quick search for it. It's a really, really simple, easy activity to do, but it trains students to listen in chunks rather than individual words. Now, we can do the same thing with reading as well. And this one I'm going to do with you, okay? So I'm going to show you a text for 10 seconds. I want you to read it as quickly as you can and to remember as much as you can. Put your hands up if you're ready. Perfect, we're ready. Here you go, here's 10 seconds. Stop reading. Now in the chat box, type in anything that you can remember. Okay, Ava says sad. Sad what though? Returning to Sydney, good voice take, nice chunk. His parents divorced, nice chunk. True identity, miserable, yeah, good Katarina. Feeling sorry for themselves, lovely Anna. Helena divorced. His parents divorced, we don't know his real identity. Lovely Agnieszka. His parents got divorced, he lost a job. Okay, perfect. You see what you've done there? All of you have written chunks of text. Collocations, word partnerships, combinations, predictable combinations that go together. So with this activity, this is called a dicto glance. So you show the text for your students for 10 seconds. They read as much as they can. 
I've misspelled that, by the way. Victo, just one L. Um, and then you repeat the process. So you'd show it to them again. You'd you'd hide it again, and then you'd reveal the text for them. So it's full of collocations, chunks, combinations, whatever you want to call them. Okay. But what it does, it forces them to read in chunks rather than individual words. Instead of on returning to Sydney, it's on returning to Sydney. It's not true identity, it's true identity. Uh, it just develops those reading skills. Okay, uh, moving on swiftly. I've got 15 minutes, okay, 15 minutes to finish. We're going well. Okay, it can help students improve their writing, especially academic writing, but also general English writing too. So, Academic writing is full of formulaic expressions to, to help to, you know, to, to, to structure writing, right? Um, very quickly in the chat box, some of you are already there. Which ones can you think of? What collocations, word partnerships can you think of that get used in academic writing? With the application of, very nice. The purpose of this thesis, very nice. Lots of stuff coming through. The aim of this work is to, exactly. They just set phrases, right? Got some more coming in. Having gathered the data, lovely. It will be tested experiment. To, yep, perfect. And that's just, that yours are quite complicated though, which is great. But even just more simple things like, in my opinion. An example of this, for instance, one more thing, in addition, in conclusion, as soon as, they are everywhere. They are the, the, the foundations, the building blocks of any piece of academic writing. Therefore, if you want your students to be better writers, this is the way forward. Set phrases, collocations, etc. But it's also true of, of general English writing as well. Whether that's an article, a report, a story, emails, letters, whatever. Um, so in this one, this is a, a letter of advice. And the focus here is on how we can give advice. I'd go to, I'd do something. You should take or you should do. Your best staying at, your best visiting. You could take, you're better off taking. If you want to relax, you should take. So it's the grammaticalized Lexus approach. They can take this and use it and not worry about the grammar because it's already being grammaticalized for them. And this is one of my favorite examples of this kind of activity. Um, you know, you, you give them choice, just a quick email to say, I'm sorry, just a short one to let you know, just a quick note to say congratulations. Fixed expressions, just building it up. It makes it so much easier than having to create it all by yourself. So collocations, word partnerships, they help with all kinds of writing. What else? Of course, it is useful for exam preparation. Uh, many, many exams have some kind of collocation or work with it. You know, thinking specifically about uh, Cambridge exams, you've got your vocabulary clothes, your multiple choice vocabulary clothes. That's all about collocation, word partnerships. Even the, the grammatical clothes, the open clothes, that is all about collocation to word partnerships because it's a lot of dependent prepositions, phrasal verbs, prepositional phrases, etc. But again, it helps with the speaking, it helps with the reading, it helps with the writing, it helps with the listening. I could argue that collocations help with every single discipline of a Cambridge exam, without question. And the final point I want to make is that it can help students escape the intermediate plateau. We often hear about this student say, oh, they've reached the intermediate plateau, they can't get above it, and they're just stuck there. Because either they're happy at that level and they think, okay, I'm intermediate, I can communicate, I can say what I want to say, I can read what I want to read, 
that's fine. But you then get the other students who, who are desperate to move on, but they can't because they are focusing on the wrong things. They're focusing on learning new improbable vocabulary. They're focusing on the grammar. So I'm sorry to say grammar is not going to help you go from intermediate to upper intermediate. Because by that point, you've already met the vast majority of grammatical structures. What is going to help you is your knowledge of collocation. And as Scott Thornbury rightly points out, the biggest difference between an intermediate and an upper intermediate or advanced level student is their awareness of and their ability to use collocation. So if ever you have students saying, oh, teacher, teacher, I want to be the next level, how can I improve? This is how they're going to improve. Not grammar, vocabulary, specifically collocation. Okay, I want to finish with five quick activities to teach collocations, all right? Um, and these can be done online as well as in the real world classroom. And the first one is called, very simply, odd one out. So we're going to do this together to see how good you are. So I'm going to give you a list of words with a key word. And you need to tell me which one does not collocate. There is only one in each line, OK? So let's have a look at the first one. Criminal. Which does not work with criminal? What does not collocate? That's how good you are. No, master criminal is fine. He's a master criminal. Like he's a criminal mastermind. Common criminal is fine, Ava. Yeah, a common criminal is just like a pickpocket or a thief or something, right? Yes, Catalina too. You think they're mean criminal? Because all criminals are mean by nature, right? We don't say, oh, he's a mean criminal. It's, it's within the meaning of the word. So well done to you, Katerina. Okay, number two. That's gone a bit funny. Fire is your key word. Oh, no, you have a gas fire. Yeah, good, Anna. You don't have a sizzling fire. You have a sizzling frying pan. A smoldering Fire is like one that's kind of dying down. A log fire with word. Yeah, so sizzling is the odd one out. Okay, next one. Secret. This is an easy one. Roaring fire was fine, uh, Matt Goretza. Yeah. Oh, you have a dark secret. Everyone's got a dark secret, right? I can see Adrian's got dark secrets. Guilty secrets. Yeah, they're fine. So, yeah. Um, Matt Goddard uh, got it right. It is, in fact, of course, say a secret. Do you have a guilty secret? Um, okay, chance. What kind of chance can you not have? Oh, no, we say, we say fat chance. Oh, fat chance. It means no chance at all. An outside chance is a possibility. Fighting chance is, a is, is okay. Yeah, good. Agnieszka and Helena got it there. Thin chance. We don't talk about a thin chance. We talk about a slim chance. Oh, it's getting a bit funny down on the PowerPoint. Okay, uh, next one. Onion. Now, there may be some disagreement with this, but I'm, I'm thinking from an English point of view. Yeah, Anna's got it right. Boiled onion. A diced onion is when you cut it, you not just uh, slice it, but you cut it into little little chunks. Yeah, boiled. You don't boil an onion, at least not in England. Maybe in Poland you do, I don't know. Um, that'd be cultural, lack of cultural awareness for me. Um, okay, last one. Holiday. Okay, there we go. Bo there we go, boiled onions. We have pickled onions, but not boiled onions in England. There we go, yeah. It's a thing in Poland. Agnieszka says Bussman. No, Bussman's holiday is possible. Yeah, good, uh, Wojciech and Agnieszka. Weekend, we didn't say weekend holiday. Oh, 
interesting. Okay, I'm reading about the, the boiling onions to colour eggs for Easter. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah, the answer was weekend. So well done to you guys. Excellent. And it's just a fun, simple activity that you get students to do, and all of a sudden, it's lots of information, lots of collocations, the words which they know. The other way of doing it is giving them the collocations, but not the, the main key word, so, i.e. the missing collocate. So, what is the missing word here? Fried, poached, raw, frozen, smoked. Bam. I'm not sure you'd have frozen egg as a collocation, Agnieszka. But otherwise, it would be fine. The answer is, as someone said there, salmon or fish. So all of them have got to collocate, right? Uh, next one. A bit trickier. Utter say of a kneeling answer. A word. Oh, you're close. Not far off, Agnieszka. Help, answer, help, kneel and help, offer help, say help. I think utter help, utter nonsense, <laughs> utter nonsense, I like that. But you don't say, you don't answer nonsense. Okay, I'm going to help you. The answer is prayer. You kneel in prayer, you utter a prayer. Okay, next one. Assess, cause, mend, repair, sustain, take, do. Straight in there, Irene. It is damage. Excellent work. Good job. I'm going to clap there. Where's my applause button? Okay, next one. Um, easy one, this one. Warm winter, summer, secondhand, trendy. Yeah, good clothes or coat. Perfect. Um, I think it's the last one. <coughs> Pull, fill, cap, grit, gnash. Brush. Yeah, your teeth, Natalia. Good stuff. Okay, so I mean, it's just a kind of a fun little activity that you can do to just highlight common words and their collocations. Something I like to do at the end of a unit of work is a, what I call a collocation jumble. Um, so I've been teaching a unit. I want to do a quick revision of collocations from that unit, and I just put them all on the board. They're all mixed up, right? So I might do something like this. And then students in their pairs have to put the collocations together. Um, so for example, fat. Actually, what I should say, the key to this is make sure that some could possibly go with two. So for example, we could say milky coffee, but we could also say milky tea. Or we could say strong tea or green tea or even black tea. Right? Good, Ava. Fat chance. What else can you find in there? Bearing in mind, we didn't teach the lesson. But yeah, some of them were during the session today. So fat chance. Pitch black. Good. Take a bus. Good. Heavy rain. Good. And you work the others out. I can see you're having fun because you're interacting, which is good. Freshly made, good Isabella, really nice one. Strong coffee, clear skies, rotten eggs, green fingers, fish. <laughs> I love fish fingers. So I think we've got fish there. Have we got fish there? I think we've got fish in that, but I, I do like fish fingers. Rotten eggs, clear, clear chance, it's fat chance. Heavy rain, freshly made, I'm going to share the answers. But most of them you've got. So it was actually catch a bus and take five. In a minute, we'll be taking five black skies. So what you know, what you're saying is fine. They are collocations, but everything has to match up to one set phrase. Okay. Again, it's just a nice revision activity for learners. Now, the final one I want to do is something called collocation stories, which is an activity I would do on a Friday afternoon with my first certificate students, because you know. Who doesn't like doing a writing lesson on a Friday? But actually, my students really enjoy the task because it involves lots of different things. It involved communication, includes vocabulary, it included speaking, and of course, writing as well. So this is how it works. Stage one, I ask students in pairs to brainstorm 
five collocations that they have learned that week. I then ask them to come up to the board and to write down two of the collocations that they learned or that, that they wrote down. So when every student has written their collocations on the board, it might look something like this. I then get students in their pairs again and tell them, OK, I want you to choose 10 of these collocations, but you are not allowed to use the ones that you wrote up originally. So 10 different collocations. And you need to write a story, maybe a 100 word story, 200 word story, whatever you want to give your students to do. And you must use those 10 collocations in that story. So all of a sudden, their story writing, so it's practicing their writing. Great. It practices their communications, they're working together. And of course, it's making them think about the vocabulary as well. So they write their story, but what I then get them to do is to rub out half of the collocation. So instead of maybe writing vividly remember, they write vividly blank. And they do that for all of the collocations. I then clean the board. And I get students to change their stories with the pair next to them. So what they've done, they've written the story and they've created their own vocabulary clothes. So the students who've got the story now, they have to read the story and write in the correct collocation. So it's a really student-centered interactive lesson for the students to do. And again, the best thing about it, minimal input from the teacher. You basically, they've provided all the language They've written the story. They've created the vocabulary clothes. All you've done is monitor and help out where needs be. And that's why students love it, because it's all about them, and it's practicing multiple skills. But at the heart of it, as we've seen all session, are these collocations, these word partnerships. Ava's written a lovely little story there. I vividly remember the excruciating pain during the heated argument with my blissfully unaware husband. I love that. That's brilliant. Good job. Thank you, Ava. Awesome. A little for you. Okay, so listen, um, that is the end of the session. I, I want to finish with a quote by the, the poet John Donne. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. But I've kind of appropriated it. No word is an island entire of itself. Every word is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Learning vocabulary is absolutely vital in partnerships. So I'm hoping that I've given you some ideas. Hopefully I've changed maybe your perspective on teaching vocabulary and its importance within the classroom. Um, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask away. Um, I should also just say that we do have more webinars coming up in the next few weeks, which you can find out more about at eltngl.com forward slash webinars and also at our in focus blog we have lots and lots of online support available at these websites okay because we know obviously teachers now are teaching in the online environment these webinars these blogs are there to help support yeah, just a few words first of all thank you thank you very Never much that was really fantastic um, team i was impressed i'm still impressed in uh, very useful and um, i'm going to hand over to so, adrian uh, Sort of Just a, a uh, reminder, uh, next week on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Polish time, we're going to have the same session, but it's going to be uh, the sort of open session to everybody. So um, anybody who would like to join us again, uh, those uh, your colleagues uh, who, are, who aren't here today with us can join the, the session on Tuesday, as I said. Uh, and saying thank you on behalf of myself and uh, National Geographic Learning Team and uh, Nova Era. Uh, Alex, I got a question. Can I say just a few words in Polish? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, jak powiedziałem, dziękuję serdecznie w imieniu swoim i, i całego teamu NGL. Um, parę punktów sobie wynotowałem, o których chciałem tylko przypomnieć w tym specyficznym yeah, yeah. dla nas wszystkich okresie. We wtorek Trzecia po południu sesja powtórzona, także można 
zaprosić kolegów, którzy nie wzięli udziału. To też, co dzisiaj się dzieje, było nagrywane, jeżeli nie będzie możliwości udziału w przyszłym tygodniu, no to będziemy też Państwu to wysyłać, udostępniać. W tej trudnej sytuacji z wybranymi uczelniami radzimy sobie w ten sposób, że jeżeli ktoś prowadzi zajęcia online ze studentami, a pracuje z naszym kursem takim jak Keynote, Outcomes Live, czy, czy nowe wchodzące kursy, tak jak tak, success with business, także mamy teraz y, najnowszą y, publikację do nauki Business English. Y, proszę być ze mną w kontakcie. Ja jestem w stanie przekazać Państwu y, te tytuły w postaci e-booków. Także to nie jest e-book dla każdego studenta, bo założenie jest takie, że student kupił książkę, ale żeby lektorowi, który jest chętny w ten sposób pracować, dać możliwość udostępnienia swojego ekranu z interaktywnym podręcznikiem. Także te zajęcia, myślę, będą ciekawsze. Mój adres mailowy na pewno Państwo znają. Jeżeli nie, to ja wpiszę potem w, w okienku czatu, żeby można było się ze mną kontaktować. To samo dotyczy tego rodzaju odprawy przed powrotem do normalności, jeśli będą chcieli Państwo zobaczyć, czy tytuły, których jeszcze, jeszcze Państwo nie znacie, czy poziomy tytułów, z którym pracujemy, inne niż te, z którymi obecnie pracujemy, proszę również zwrócić się do mnie. Sample kopis wysyłamy przez cały czas. Oczywiście na adresy domowe, także od razu proszę o podawaniu w mailu adresów domowych, bo na adresy uczelniane te wysyłki nie są realizowane. E-sklep. Dla studentów, jeżeli ktoś ma ochotę, cały czas e-sklep działa, realizowane są wysyłki, kody rabatowe dla Państwa studentów też w dalszym ciągu są aktualne, także działamy no, na, ile, na ile możemy, staramy się odpowiadać na, 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 na Państwa potrzeby. Jeżeli chodzi o spotkanie w naszym gronie, ja tak planuję cichutko, oczywiście wszystko zależy od tego, jak szybko wszystko wróci do, do, do tej normy, zorganizować spotkania z Państwem, żeby nas no, no, nie minęła jakaś okazja zetknięcia się z, z ciekawym speakerem na jesieni tego roku. Gdzieś tam w okienku czatu w pewnym momencie pisałem o English for Academic Purposes, też Alex wspomniał Pathways. No mocno, mocno będziemy szli w, w tym kierunku, no jako że zajmuję się uczelniami, no to w, 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 chcemy dać Państwu coś więcej niż, tak jak zawsze mówię, kolejne podręczniki do GE czy, czy do BE. Także dziękując raz jeszcze wpisuję swój adres mailowy w okienku czatu. Życzę Państwu przede wszystkim dużo zdrowia. Trzymajmy się razem, przetrwamy to, no byle, byle by jak najszybciej ta zaraza od nas wszystkich odeszła. Kłaniam się nisko. I do zobaczenia. Dziękuję. Yeah, it, I'm, I'm, I'm ready, Alex. So, not yet. Okay. Did you say about the certificate? Okay, that's fine. So just to say that the, the certificate is downloadable for you now. You can probably see on the screen there, you can download the certificate, which is editable. You need to just put your name in it, okay? Um, so this is the only way that we're going to be providing it to you. So if you don't download it now, then you won't be able to get a hold of it otherwise, I'm afraid to say. So please make sure you download it as a record of your, your, of your participation, your attendance. And I, I would just say as well that you've been a fantastically interactive, participatory audience today. So thank you so much. It makes yeah, even doing these kind of things so much easier <laughs> um, when you have a responsive audience. So great job, Poland teach, Polish teachers at, at your universities. Yeah, high five. Um, perfect. But um, otherwise, if no, 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 no more questions, I. Guess it just leaves, leaves me to say, same to you, Alex. A, Thank a you. wonderful Thank weekend. Thanks again. And of course, stay safe. Keep those hands clean. Um, I guess you're all self isolating. Um, yeah, to look after each other. Okay. So, thank you very much. Uh, have a nice weekend. And, and I hope to be in Poland, you know, sometime soon. <laughs>